Welcome back everybody to another reaction video and uh, today we're going back to the American Battlefield Trust and I highly recommend that you subscribe to them if you're at all interested in the American Civil War. Uh, they do some great quality content but not only do they put out some great content on their YouTube channel but they have a, a such an important mission. Uh, their mission to those of you who may be new to it is to uh, acquire and preserve uh, American battlefields uh, where there's a threat especially of uh, those being purchased by developers and turning into housing or uh, shopping centers and things like that. Uh, so it's a great mission. Uh, it's an important mission. Uh, and in the process, they put out some really great content too. So uh, I'll put a link in the description below to this specific video, but check out their channel. Uh, I do a lot of their stuff because I think it's really good and I believe so strongly in their mission. But today we're going to be looking at uh, the Civil War, four, or four minutes of Civil War myths. And now you might think in four minutes it can't cover that much, but this dude covers a lot of myths in four minutes. So there's going to be a lot of pausing going on. And I encourage you to add your own myths in the comment section below, or let's talk about the stuff that he th he talks about. I think some of these are well understood, so I won't cover every single one of them. And don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe and hit the notification bell if you haven't already. Let's dive in. I'm going to be riding the pause button on this one. Myth is pervasive in history, and it seems like the American Civil War attracts myth and legend more than other conflicts, and it drives some of us just crazy. Despite all good evidence that says that most Civil War surgeries north and south were performed under anesthesia, we still have the myths about soldiers screaming through every amputation and biting bullets and whatnot. Despite all evidence that we have with records and pictures and everything like that, this idea that Civil War regiments and brigades are populated with 12 and 13 and 14 and even 15-year-old boys is just crazy. All right, so let's talk about those two first of all. Yeah, uh, the majority of Civil War surgeries, amputations, things like that were done with anesthetic. They had uh, anesthetic at the time, chloroform, ether, things of that nature. But that doesn't mean that that myth is untrue. Uh, especially in larger battles where they would very quickly run out of those supplies. There were men that had to bite the bullet, so to speak, or bite down on a stick or something and be wide awake while the amputation was performed. Just wasn't always that way. Uh, so that's kind of, a, I think, a, a mix of myth and legend. And honestly, the second one, I don't think I ever believed or really even ever heard that the armies were populated by a lot of like really young kids. Um, that doesn't mean that they didn't have young kids in the army, but by and large, it was because they lied about their age, not because they were recruiting 13, 14 year old uh, people, but there were young kids like that in the armies. And there were also old men. My own great, 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 great grandfather was 50. Oh gosh. Let's see. He was born in 1812. So he was, um, he was 49, 50 years old when he uh, enlisted in 1861. I uh, had to lie about his age because I think the max age for enlistment was 45 at the time. Most Civil War soldiers were 18, 19, 20, even 21 and 22 and above from there. Sure, people tried to watch the Battle of Bull Run, but they weren't on the battlefield. They weren't even right next to the battlefield. They were four miles away with their picnic baskets, maybe hearing some of the battle, seeing a little smoke rise from the battlefield. And despite being able to read their writings, understand Civil War people, we still can't help but think that somehow we're smarter than people of the Civil War. All right, so let's talk about this one for a second. He talks about the education level. And um, I, I don't think I've ever thought that people at the time were not as smart as people today. Um, but I think the, the standard and the expectation for education was different. The, the reality was that the, the majority of people didn't go to high school and graduate like they do today. Um, it just wasn't something that was expected uh, or necessary, I guess you could say. Uh, you know, you go back even to like the 1920s, and a lot of my ancestors who were steel workers or who were farmers or bricklayers, things like that, uh, they couldn't read or write. They didn't need to read or write for their jobs. Uh, and and they would put their mark and X for their signature. Now, that doesn't mean that there weren't a lot of educated people at the time, but the the expectation level of education and the uh, the literacy level was much lower than it is today. Civil War. If only we were around, we would have told them a better way to fight, a better way to conduct their government. And it's just wrong. 
And you would be hard pressed to find a Civil War topic that is more hotly debated than why the Civil War started in the first place. I think the first key is to separate why the South seceded from why people fought. And when you can do that, yes. I think you can understand it a little bit better. That's a hundred percent true and i'm sure he's going to get into this a little more i talk about this all the time with people uh there is a difference between why the government went to war or seceded or committed to the conflict and why the individual soldier did and that's true in every conflict you know the reasons why uh people enlist is very different than why maybe the government went to war so yeah zero question that the South seceded over the issue of slavery. And I, I can already think of the people who I know are followers of this channel who are going to argue with that. They all agree on that. I mean, they said that. They said that was why they were seceding. That does not mean that the majority of men enlisted to fight to defend the institution of slavery. Different issues. So both can be true at the same time. The war can be about slavery and be about states' rights and be about the North was invading us and I'm protecting my home all at the same time. Just like the North, Lincoln went to war to preserve the Union. That doesn't mean that's why people enlisted. People enlisted for all kinds of different reasons. I don't know why people debate about why the South seceded. The South told us why they seceded. They told us in the Articles of Secession. They told us in the documents that came with secession conventions and the commissioners that went to other states. They seceded because of slavery. Now, the idea that Southerners all fought for slavery is just crazy. South and North had reasons for fighting, and there were hundreds of different reasons. They were fighting for a sense of adventure, fighting to keep their homes, yep. fighting for a job, fighting in order to protect their country, to save the Union, to save the South, fighting for states' rights. You pick. I think that myth really serves to help us paint people of the 19th century with a broad brush. And I think nobody suffers from that more than George McClellan. <laughs> McClellan did a lot of things very well. You try to manage an army. You try to manage the largest army in the world and be a great communicator, a great tactician, a great administrator, a great strategist, and do all that at once and do it all really well. And so, all right, let's talk about McClellan for a second here because I tend to be of the camp that McClellan did not do that well. Yes, he was a great administrator. Yes, he was good at training and organizing the army. But show me one instance where the guy did well in the field uh, tactically with the army. It just isn't there. Once he had to actually use the army, he was no good. And I think what makes it harder for me to show any grace to McClellan in this area is just how gosh darn arrogant the guy was about it. He was so full of, full of himself. Uh, and, and just the way that he looked down on people like Abraham Lincoln, called the guy a buffoon, called him an ape. Um, the one time Lincoln goes to his house and waits all day for him and McClellan finally shows up and then goes upstairs without even so much as showing his face to the president who's been waiting for him. I just, I, I have no patience for George McClellan at all. Um, but that's just me. And I know there are plenty of people who will defend him. Uh, and I see he's going to talk about uh, Burnside here. So Burnside's a different story altogether. And Ambrose Burnside, poor Burnside. Okay, the bridge is known notoriously, like he never captured the thing. He totally captured yep. Burnside's bridge. It should bear his name. Sure, it took a while to get it. And you know what? He had independent commands sometimes. He did really well when he had his independent commands. Look at him at Knoxville, where he defeats James Longstreet. And we do the same thing for the- So, uh yeah, Burnside was not a bad general. He was actually pretty good. Uh, he just wasn't a great army commander, um, especially in 1862. And Burnside didn't want that command. Uh, in fact, I've said this before, but nobody knew better than Ambrose Burnside that he wasn't fit for command of the Army of the Potomac. But he did really, after he left command of the Army of the Potomac, for the most part, for the rest of the war, he performed pretty well. Um, and, and at one point in 1864, he actually had an kind of an independent command. Um, he commanded a corps, I think it was the Ninth Corps. Um, but the reason that he was not attached to the Army of the Potomac in 1864 uh, is that Burnside actually outranked uh, George Meade, and so he couldn't serve under George Meade because even though Meade commanded the Army of the Potomac, uh, Burnside's promotion to Major General predated uh, Meade's, and so he couldn't serve under him. It was one of those just kind of weird quirks of how things operated the confederates no john bell hood wasn't on laudanum or some other opiate throughout the civil war he probably hardly ever was from the evidence we had but you know what if he was i wouldn't blame him because the man was brutally injured a couple of times during the war um 
he, he loses a, a leg at one point. He loses the use of an arm uh, during the war. Uh, fantastic brigade and division commander. Again, not you know one of those people just wasn't come, cut out to the command of an army. Stonewall Jackson didn't always win. He lost some of the time as well. Right? And yeah, Stonewall Jackson, I told you I'd be pausing a lot here. Jackson, you know, I think he's best remembered for his brilliant Valley campaign, but he immediately follows the Valley campaign up by showing up uh, to serve in the Seven Days command, uh, campaign outside of Richmond and was terrible during the Seven Days. Got lost a couple of times, was slow to react, um, did not do well at all. And and there, there may have been factors for that, but Stonewall Jackson was not the perfect general people remember him for. I think a lot of that gets mythologized because of how he died. Jackson Bragg, he's probably not always talking to himself. And Jefferson Davis was not captured no, he wasn't. in petticoats at the end of the Civil War. Wasn't dressed as a woman. I understand the propagation of myths because they make for good stories, but the stories of the Civil War are quite good enough without any yep. of that going on. Abraham Lincoln wrote the Gettysburg Address partly in Washington. He probably finished it in Gettysburg. He didn't finish it on the back of an envelope. We know what he wrote it on. We have the things he wrote it on. Stop propagating that myth if you are indeed. Yep. And just because some people at the Battle of Cold Harbor pinned their names onto the back of their coats does not mean that everybody did, nor does it mean that everybody at Cold Harbor was killed and that all those people who were killed were killed in one final charge, the one U.S. Grant regretted. So I've never heard this idea that somehow Cold Harbor was unique in people pinning their names. That was something they did at battles all the time. Uh, because they didn't have dog tags and they were afraid of not being identified and ending up in an unknown grave. So that was something that was very common throughout the war. And yeah, Cold Harbor was like a couple of week long battle. So it was not just that June 3rd attack that everybody talks about where everybody died. But um, I don't know. I guess I didn't realize that was really something that was debated at all. No, the Battle of Gettysburg did not start over shoes. There's no shoe factory anywhere around here. No. And... The other thing about Gettysburg, Jubal Early had actually come through Gettysburg about a week before the battle. Um, and if there had been shoes there, they would have taken them then because he actually came in and demanded a ransom. And, and since they didn't have the money that he was demanding from them, they actually offered to just open up their stores to him. Uh, th the main reasons for Gettysburg as a battlefield uh, was, number one, of the road networks. It was just a natural place to, when your army spread out over multiple corps in different cities and different locations, it was just a natural place to, re to kind of bring everything back together. Uh, but secondly, I think that the reason that Heath's division was coming into town was they were there to requisition supplies in general, not specifically shoes. Um, and the other thing about Gettysburg that I think is a myth, and I don't know if he'll mention this or not, but was the idea that it was a really hot, like 100 degree July. Uh, it wasn't. It was actually kind of overcast. And I think July 1st, it was only like in the mid 70s. Uh, I think it got up to may maybe 85, 86 degrees by July 3rd. But July 1st was actually a pretty mild day for Southern Pennsylvania. And when you go to historic sites today, not just Civil War sites, the ghost stories that are being told <laughs> are just ridiculous. It's not that there's no such thing as ghosts. It's that the stories that they tell on ghost tours and in ghost books are absolutely made up to make money. Yep. So at least study your history with your eyes wide open. I have no problem with people reading historical fiction, watching movies about the Civil War or history that might not be entirely correct. Just know that there's a lot of myth associated with history and you should be able to separate fact from fiction. He was, he was pretty forceful about that, and I like that because uh, obviously this is something he's passionate about, and I am too. Um, so what are your uh, most common myths that you've heard that you later found out weren't true? Or what are things that you believe but you're not so sure whether or not they are backed up factually? Let's have a, com a conversation about that. Use the comment section below. Add your own thoughts to the things that he and I have talked about in this. And definitely make sure you check out the American Battlefield Trust, all their great content. Subscribe to them. Support them. It's a great cause, and they're doing some really good things. Thanks for watching.